Thanks everybody for coming. Um, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm a practicing structural engineer, so I usually like to gauge the audience a little bit. Uh, how many architects are here? Great. Any structural engineers? Yes. I'm not by myself today. Winning. All right. So uh, we're going to talk about some of my projects today. Let's see if I can get the, the presentation to work. There we go. All right, so just a little about WJE. Uh, we work on existing structures. So anything that's already built, that's what we're working on. So we're um, architects, engineers, material scientists. We have a lab up in Northbrook that we use. Uh, and we're just essentially working on buildings that people have already constructed and either need to get repaired or renovated. We've got offices all over the United States. Uh, I work out of our Chicago office. And uh, kind of the flavor of the, the resume online kind of gives you a broad range of things we worked on. Um, I mean, today we're gonna to be talking about three projects uh, that I've worked on recently, and I think you'll enjoy them, but we've worked on a lot of projects. And like I said, we've got structural engineers, architects, uh, material scientists, um, and some specialists and technicians that help us out as well. So I'd like to start the presentation today with kind of asking you to think about what your passion is. Um, I came across WJ really by chance, and I've been working there for 20 years, and I really loved it. Um, so I've done Engineers Without Borders through WJE. I've been on the top of the Gateway Arch. I've worked on Aloha Stadium. Um, I've really gotten to work on some of my favorite buildings. So the first project that I'll talk to you about today is uh, the Atmospheric Wave Wall. Um, has anybody been to Willis Tower lately? and seen this, it's really a unique facade piece that they've added there. Um, so if you, walk if you walk past it, you'll notice that there's this large piece of artwork on Jackson Street. And it's there because when they did the renovation, they needed some place to put in um, shafts for mechanical exhaust. And no one really wanted to see a really big blank wall. So the building worked with um, Gensler and Thornton Tomasetti who did the base building renovation and then Olafer, who's an artist out of Germany, uh, to create this piece of artwork. And it's supposed to be inspired by the waves on Lake Michigan. So the other reason that I kind of like my job is I get to learn about cool stuff like this. And if you want to learn more about it, uh, there's um, a session on the Netflix series Abstract where they talk about just the artist studio. So this was built like a Swiss watch. Um, the, you know, it's an art installation. So if you think about how art installations go together, they're very specific. And that's a little bit uh, different than when we do buildings, right? You have tolerances, you know, the, the contractor is not gonna put something exactly where you think it's gonna go on your plans, things like that. And there, there's always ways things need to fit together, but on art installations, you know, they're very exact. They're usually installed inside in a museum, something like this. Um, and here we didn't really have that. They had panels that were getting put together and then put onto brackets that were gonna be mounted to other clips that were then gonna be attached to the stud walls behind. So these were also built on aliquor panels. That was the panel that was used as the um, sort of base sheet for the art installation. And you can see the orange arrows pointing to the aliquor panel and then the entire art installation is outboard of that. So we had a lot of room that we had to take those outside bed loads, snow loads, um, and everything, and wind loads, and get those all the way back to the main structural fitting. So we ended up being the engineer of record for the project. Uh, the art studio in Germany had uh, a German structural engineer do calculations that then we reviewed and confirmed they worked for US codes. It was extremely interesting because they were in metric, and we don't use metric here, and they were in German. So I had to have someone in our company help me translate them so I could know what they were checking. Uh, but the art, it was ended up being kind of interesting because the art studio had planned on installing the art wall themselves. Uh, so they had built the whole, they had mocked the whole thing up in their studio and then shipped it in all these crates um, kind of over boats uh, to get to the US and then they you know get through customs and then on trains and get all the way over here. Uh, and then because of COVID, they couldn't come install themselves. So then the owner had to get local contractors to install artwork. Um, and there was constant communication with the art studio back in Germany. 
And so here's just some photos during construction. So these are the L profiles that the panels kind of sit on to take the gravity load. And what we started noticing while the L profiles were going up is you can kind of see in the photo on the bottom right, there's a gap between the wall and the L profile because um, there wasn't enough coordination between the building tolerances for the backup wall and the art installation. So a couple of slides ago, I mentioned that the art installation is kind of built like a Swiss watch, but that didn't get communicated all the way back through to the design team and the contractor. So they built the wall like they normally would for facade panels that have a lot of uh, tolerances and a lot of shimming pieces. And now we've got to fit an art wall on. So we ended up having to design some repairs that they installed and then we had to do some fixes to the waterproofing to make that wall watertight again. Um, but they kept, you know, we got that solved and then here they're putting on the alicor panels and the brackets in the front. And then now the tile clusters are going up. Um, so they had the whole sidewalk closed. They installed some of these from swing stages and some of them from lifts. And so the lesson here is tolerances are important. <laughs> you guys have probably heard this a lot, but I thought this might like show how important they are. <laughs> All right, the next project that I wanna to talk to you a little bit about is One North Dearborn. Um, so this project is pretty cool because uh, in Chicago, we've got a lot of buildings that were constructed in like the 1900s, 1920s, and they have very specific construction uh, due to the Chicago fire. And so we often encounter these now when buildings are renovating, tenants are moving in, they want internal stairs or they don't need the internal stair anymore and they need it filled in. Um, and a lot of times, uh, you're being asked to do renovations on steel that's not constructed to modern standards. So you need to be aware a little bit about what the historic materials are that you're working with. So um, standards for structural steel were kind of being developed in the 1900s, 1920s. So steel mills were putting steel out and then ASTM standards were also being published at the same time, but they were being published to kind of document the steel that was coming out of the mills. So they weren't, the mills were not doing the steel according to ASTM standards, which is what it is now, if you talk to structural engineers. So um, any steel construction before 1960 may have steel in it that you don't want to weld to. And this is important to keep in mind when you're doing renovation projects, because uh, you'll want to kind of have an idea of how you're going to be able to talk to your structural engineer or frame these. So we can review the original design uh, drawings. We can go take a look at the connections in the field and we can kind of talk to the building to determine if they've had renovation projects before to try to get a sense of what's been done. Um, and in this building, this is some typical photos of the framing. So this is clay tile arch construction. It's really popular in this vintage of buildings in Chicago. And they're basically loose laid terracotta blocks um, that they build kind of on formwork just like they would an arch, right? There's a center key and then they take the formwork out and then the arch stays there and can support load. Um, the structural steel shapes are built up and so they're all riveted together. So here's some photos during construction. Uh, the client wanted a large internal stair to connect two floors together. And often as structural engineers will look at a photo like this and be like, oh, that's so cool. I love working on old steel. And then you have to really remember that you shouldn't treat old steel like new steel. They're totally different things, right? So um, what you wanna keep in mind is that uh, you need to assess for weldability and soundness of the base metal. So when you're trying to join two materials together, you, there's a lot of things that go into it, right? The type of welding, the electrode used, which is like the weld metal, how the process is putting heat into the base material. And that's all going to affect that base material. And so when we're talking about these uh, historic steels, we care about the strength of the material, but then also what the material consistency is. So when steel is formed, it's rolled through these rollers. And what happened um, in this historic steel is it, it wasn't as clean. It's often referred to as dirty steel. And so you have um, inclusions in the steel. And then when it goes through the mill, those inclusions get rolled out into like long pieces. Uh, so you can imagine if you try to pull something like this steel apart, it would kind of come apart like, 
I don't know, maybe like layers of a cake. Like if you had a layered cake and you tried to pull the top layer off, you would just rip it off at that interior um, kind of layer of frosting. Uh, and so we have ways as structural engineers that we can review this. Um, the reason that this is important though is because it takes time and money in that investigation phase, right? So if you're not anticipating it, uh, it could be a hiccup in your project. And like I said, this could lead to lamellar tearing, which is where that steel can just kind of tear apart depending on the type of inclusions that are in the steel. So the way that we can assess this is we can take cores and take them to our metallurgists in our lab or other labs that have metallurgists, and they can review that steel to see kind of what's going on um, at the molecular level. So sometimes um, this can be age dependent. So here's three photos um, of some steel and the first one's from 1922, and then the second one's from 1905, and the third one is from 1886. And you can kind of see like the older the steel gets, the more inclusions it has. And modern steel doesn't have these inclusions because we want our steel to be weldable. Like people want to make those clean looking connections, contractors want to do welding. So now there's a lot more processes in place to clean out the steel um, so that, that it can be weldable. Um, so a structural engineer will probably say you should assess it. So I thought I should throw on a little bit of a slide, right? So you're using microscopy, which is again, just looking at the molecular level of that steel. Um, and again, you won't have these problems with modern steel, which is like 1965 or later. And so if you have unsound or unweldable steel, it doesn't mean you can't do anything to it. You just have to think about not welding it. So oftentimes structural engineers will do bolted connections or there's now um, pretty good blind bolts that will work as well. Uh, we can also use threaded or tapped holes. Um, a lot of times we'll, we'll just go back to a bolting solution or do more investigation um, if that's why we're welding to begin with. So on our project, uh, we didn't have any ASTM standards listed on the drawings. And due to the age of the building, we knew that ASTM standards might not be so helpful to us. So we took some cores of the steel and sent them up to our lab and we had inclusions. So uh, this was kind of a bummer for the design team because it meant we had to take a pause on our side and redo some of the connections. And here's the two connections that we ended up doing. Um, we, re we went and, um, redesigned some of the connections that were going into the columns, which is where we had a lot of load, and uh, redesigned the connections to avoid welding to get that kind of like tearing apart of the steel that we had talked about before. And um, kind of helped educate the design team and the owners kind of on the steel that they had on their building. And oftentimes this uh, type of investigation work would be great to do during like the planning or feasibility stage of a project. And then this is what the final stair looks like. Um, it's a little bit too bad they, they finalized the construction right when COVID was hitting and I had a friend that worked here and so she didn't get to see the stair for like two years because they all worked from home. Um, but I think they're finally getting back into the space and they're using it as like an assembly space for like town hall meetings. So lesson number two is just say no to landlord here. You'll probably never need to know this, but if someone says lamellar tearing, you'll be like, oh, I heard about that once. All right, and then the third project that I want to talk about um, today is the Gateway Arch. So um, how many people have been to the Gateway Arch? Yeah, it's pretty cool. You ride those like little tiny trams like up to the top. Uh, it's, it's really one of my favorite structures. Um, this photo was actually taken um, with a camera out like with the observation glass removed. So um, we'll show you some pictures of the access that we used to get to get up to the arch there. So as you guys might um, know, it was a monument to westward expansion in the United States. And it's designed as a catenary arch, which is the shape of the structure itself. And it was designed in 1947. Um, and it was constructed over a couple years and um, it has like millions of visitors a year. Like a lot of people go there to check it out. Um, it's a very well-known structure. Um, I had actually never seen it until we started working on it. And I was really glad I got the opportunity. So we ended up getting called by the National Park Service. Um, if you've been there, you may have noticed you can see staining on the stainless steel, kind of depending the way the sun is kind of hitting the steel and how long you kind of look and squint your eyes at it. Uh, so the photo here on the right 
is showing kind of like the dirty area that's about halfway up the arch. And uh, NPS was concerned um, that it could be possibly corrosion, right? So is it something that has to be addressed or is it just something that needs to be maintained or cleaned? Uh, the gateway arch was designed to be maintenance-free structure. So there's actually no way to access the outside of the arch. You can open up the hatch at the top to change the airplane light and the observation deck windows swing open so that they can clean them and then that's it. You can see it at the base and you can see it at the top. There's no way to get to it at the, mid the midpoints. while we were doing this work, um, helicopters kept flying around us and it was making it hard for us. Yeah, so let's kind of talk a little bit more about that. Let's see if I can get there. Okay. Uh, so we first did a lot of research into construction and this uh, cartoon was in one of like the archive kind of bins. And we all kind of laughed when we looked at it because if you kind of uh, you can go there and read through the documents yourself. There's a, a well-maintained library with all the documents in it. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about how they're going to build the arch and they're going to construct the north leg and the south leg at the same time and just kind of like hope they meet in the middle. And there's like this really uh, kind of long story uh, about how they put this last piece in where they wanted to do it at night where the sun wasn't gonna be hitting it and kind of expanding one side of the arch and not the other. Um, but like the mayor wanted it to be like a, you know, a big thing that could be on the news and everything. So they instead uh, had to do it during the day and they had the fire department come and like spray water as high as they could on both sides of the arch to try to keep the temperature down as much as possible so they could fit this last piece in. Clearly it worked, they didn't have to use a ladder to get from one side to another. Um, so the arch has two skins of steel. So you're seeing the exterior steel, which is quarter inch stainless steel plate. Quarter inch stainless steel is pretty thin. Um, it's type uh, 304 steel and it has a number three finish on it. And that's pretty similar to like what you would have on like your fridge or your dishwasher at home. Uh, this is a photo of the steel being finished um, in the shop. And they ended up um, making these panels in a fab shop and then uh, putting them on train cars and getting them over to the site. And then they had to use cranes and everything to get them into place. So there was a lot of discussion about how to protect the stainless steel. You can imagine you've designed this like beautiful looking stainless steel structure. And the last thing you want is the steel to get scratched. Like, how are you gonna get those scratches out? So there was a lot of discussion on how could they protect the panels without, you know, kind of gooping them up with any sort of like, you know, sheathing that they had to take off or anything like that. And you can actually still see some of the scratches in the structure. Now, if you go take a look at it, you know what you're looking for. So they also built these creeper derricks on the outside of the arch so that they could actually have access to the top level to put on, you know, the next panel. And to attach this, they had to put um, bolts through the exterior steel. So you can see that if you're on site too, and you kind of know what you're looking for. Um, so these were all things that were kind of scratching the steel during construction. Here's another photo of a creeper derrick. So after the arch was constructed, they then used the derricks to disarray, like to dissemble the rails on the outside as they were bringing them down. And while they were doing this, they were also cleaning the panels. So I think it shows up a little bit here in the photo on the left. Uh, you can kind of see vertical streaks when you're out there. And we think that vertical streaking was due to the cleaning material that they were using kind of as they were coming down. 
and then they just don't have a good way to access all the sides as they're coming down, right? So like you've you've constructed it and kind of added, you know, dirt and contaminants onto the steel and now you're trying to clean it, but maybe you're just kind of smearing things around, right? And so like, how do you actually get clean? So our phase one um, <clears throat> was, as I said, the National Park Service started noticing this staining uh, probably in the 80s and they waited a little bit, you know, just trying to assess if it was getting worse or, you know, how to kind of budget to access this because as I said, there's no way to get to the stainless steel itself. Uh, so my first portion of the job was I sat up in that uh, tower of the courthouse kind of across the street with a spotter scope and binoculars. And I just like tried to make my own assessment of how dirty I thought each of the panels were. And I did this for like a week, just like counting how many panels and then marking it on some survey sheets. So not all portions of my job were glamorous. Some of us just using spotter scopes. Uh, then we also did a historic structures report. So if you work on existing buildings, you may have heard of an HSR. It's often a report that gets done um, before any major work is done on a substantial structure so that the owner has sort of a full history of the, the structure to date and kind of an assessment of kind of where they are before they start the project. So these are the archives that I was saying earlier. I mean, this whole room is just full of stuff on the construction of the gateway arch. And then we did phase two, um, which was, um, I think I didn't mention it before, but the, the arch is actually two, two skins of steel. So you see that exterior steel on the outside. And then if you're on the inside, that's where the trams go. And there's also two stairwells that go up each leg. And from inside the stairwell, you can see the regular mild steel, and those are separated by an air gap. In the lower half of the arch, that air gap was filled with concrete to make it stiffer, and the top portion of the arch, it was left open. Uh, so they were concerned that there could be water condensation between the two layers, because again, there's like one hatch or something to look between the two. So we made some openings and did some instrumentation to help them understand what the interior climate of the arch would be. And then we got to part three, which was the corrosion investigation. So this is where they asked us to actually get two hands-on portions of the arch uh, that they don't usually have access to. And then we also did some cleaning trials at the base of the arch to help them understand um, what methods might be most useful for removing some of the corrosion. So originally they only asked us to get to the base of the arch. And we were like, that'll be pretty easy. We'll just get some really big lifts. And they were like, oh, but we also want you to get to station 35, which is like halfway up the arch. And we were like, how are we gonna do that? Like we like were thinking about like, could we bring a crane in and like kind of crane someone over there? Could we build a really big scaffold? Like, how could we do this? Um, so here was the easy part. Uh, I just had to call around like five or six states around St. Louis to try to find two of the largest lifts that they could have because if you've been there, you know that there's kind of that like sloped area, the sloped walkway, and that has snow melt pavers in it. So we couldn't drive anything over there. So we had to get a really far reach uh, to get over to the steel. And then we decided for that point halfway up, we would use industrial rope access. So WJE has a difficult access team and we're trained on ropes to access buildings such as this. Uh, you may have also seen uh, after the um, earthquake in DC where we use difficult rope access to assess the Washington Monument. And so you can kind of see if you squint, there's a little guy out there, that's Dave. He's out there taking a look at what's going on. So we had to come up with a concept for getting uh, Dave out there. This was the first uh, concept, this San Pellegrino bottle with just like a, a scale. Um, and what we were trying to do was figure out like is there actually a way to set up and bring ropes so that someone could safely come down the inside face of that steel and still be adjacent uh, to the steel to be able to like be close enough to touch it? So um, the system consists of anchors at the top and intermediate anchor and some anchors at the bottom. And I'll just show you some photos of that just so you can kind of get a sense of scale for it. Um, we had two WJE staff out on the ropes uh, going down the arch. This is Dave on the right and Aaron on the left. And then we had staff at the base of the arch and then staff at the top of the arch 
um, and had safety plans and rescue plans in place just in case something went awry. So here's a view of the top anchors. So um, this photo is taken from the hatch that you get out to to change the airplane light. And so you can kind of see the anchors, they kind of sling around the top of the arch and then go back in through the observation deck windows to actually tie off to the main, the, the structure of the arch there. Here's a view of the inside. So if you've been to the top of the arch, this is where you guys have looked out the windows. So like I said, we have those windows open and we're actually just physically slinging around the structural steel that's between the windows. And then we had some anchorages at the bases. Um, we ended up getting quite a bit of weather delay here. We thought we were gonna be on site for five days and we ended up being on site for two weeks. Uh, there was a lot of wind that um, is much windier at the top of the arch than at the bottom. So we often just had to kind of like wait to see if the wind would die down to see if we would get any time to do rigging. So the good part about the snowmelt system is they had them on. So I, I couldn't find it in time for this presentation, but there's one of just like a bunch of us just like laying on the stone because we're cold and it's warm and we're just like waiting for the wind to break. Um, another non-glamorous part of the WGE job. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we did all that work, and then now uh, here is David. And now he's trying to get himself back from that down point back onto the outside of the arch. And you can kind of get a sense here for all the rigging uh, that he has with him. Uh, open. Uh, just yep. keeping himself safe, and then also all the cleaning supplies uh, that he brought out there with him. Uh, this, these brackets that you're kind of seeing on the edge of the arch, where we custom made them to fit the corners of the arch. And then this threaded rod that you see, uh, because the arch itself tapers, uh, it can kind of taper as they're bringing all their equipment down the arch with them. So they start at the top and then go down to midpoint, and then they just kind of keep propelling down to the bottom. Uh, we also had to be really careful with our boots and our knee pads because we didn't want to leave a bunch of scuff marks on the arch because no access. So then we'd leave all these scuff marks and then someone can see them for the rest of their lives. So a lot of planning went into this one. Um, so what did we find? Uh, we categorized everything into three um, areas, blemishes, deposits, and discolorations. So you can kind of see here in the photo on the left that oil canning, and that's occurring because that steel is so thin, it's quarter inch, and there's no concrete between the two layers at the upper spot. So you can see just the steel getting warm and just deflecting in between the backup stiffeners that are there. Um, if you're on site, you can also see um, pretty clearly the photo on the right, which is there's kind of a checkerboard pattern of the steel. And we found out that that's basically due to how the panels are finished. So when that finish goes on, right, it's like your fridge. So the rollers go and like finish the surface. And if you finish the surface this way, or you flip that panel around and it's finished this way, it's kind of like corduroy pants. You brush them one way and it's light and you brush them another way and it's dark. That's what's happening with these panels. That's why you're getting this checkerboard uh, look. Uh, you can also see a lot of blemishes on the arch, um, which is weld spatter. So some of these welds were done in the shop and some of them were done in the field. And the ones in the field are just harder to do. And so you get a lot of weld spatter at the field ones um, and it's every other weld. So if you're out there, you can, you can see it yourself now that you know what to look for. And there's also a lot of blemishes. So if you've been down at the base, that's where you can actually touch the steel. And <laughs> People uh, use keys and stuff to scratch their names and initials into it. And they use like hammers to ping it and everything. Um, and so these are scratches that are deeper than that finished profile. So that's why you can see them. And there's, there's not a good way to refinish those panels so that they match everything else. Um, so we, all, we already talked about the weld spatter. So what happens on the weld spatter is it collects, I'll call it dirt. It, it's collecting, you know, things from the air on them. And so the photo on the left is like a close-up look at one of the wells and you can kind of see how dirty it is. Um, and if you look at the photo on the, the right, you can kind of see like 
every other weld looks really dirty. It's because every other weld was performed in the field and not the shop. So you're getting more spatter and you're accumulating more of that dirt on the arch. And then as it rains and stuff washes down it, it's just washing down and getting in those finishes, you know, from that number three finish and, and just makes it look dirty. <laughs> So there's also a lot of discoloration at the arch. So they're getting uh, corrosion um, at the base due to just salts, right? So uh, if you don't keep your stainless steel clean, it can start to corrode over time. Um, and then they're getting corrosion at the areas of the incised graffiti from um, like your keys are not stainless steel. So if you use your keys to scratch your name into the arch, you're leaving steel material that's not stainless steel and it will start to corrode. Don't, don't go scratch your name in the arch, please. So we also did some cleaning trials because NPS was interested in knowing like what level of effort would be required to take care of some of this stuff. So if you go there, this is on the, uh, oh, it's on one of the legs. I don't wanna tell you the wrong one now. But if you go over to the arch now and you walk around both bases, you can see where we did these um, because they actually wanted us to try some cleaning solutions and some refinishing to see um, if it would be possible to match the finish that, that was on the arch originally. We also did some cleaning trials at station 35, which is where we ran the ropes, but we couldn't really bring any acid with because we don't want acid to get on the ropes. So these cleanings were really kind of like soaps and light solvents, like nothing really that harsh because again, we're you know on ropes to do this. So our conclusions were basically the arch is serviceable, right? We're not really seeing any corrosion, which is great for the arch, right? Um, there's no structural concerns. It's all, you know, anomalies from uh, construction or kind of ongoing dirt and maintenance issues. And then again, we've got our cleaning trials. And so we gave them some information on what would be um, most helpful for removing some of that corrosion staining, especially at the base where they can access it from the lift. Um, they can't really resurface it to match the finishes, but they can at least start to remove some of that corrosion product. Um, and again, the graffiti is really unfortunate. Um, you really are not going to be able to successfully refinish that steel so it matches. Um, it's probably best just to put in more security measures to prevent it. I mean, it's unfortunate because the cool part of the gateway arch is people can actually go up and like put their hands on the steel and kind of feel something so magnificent. So lesson number three is access is everything. We couldn't have done this project without access and that's really the only reason it took NPS so long uh, to try to assess what they were seeing on site. So with that, uh, I've given you a kind of glimpse into the world of forensic engineering um, I hope it was a little interesting for you. And I think my biggest lesson learned is to just really think about what you're passionate about and see if you can find a job that aligns with that.